Jumpers. Are we all right? We all had a good Christmas? Plenty of turkey, fed up with it already? I could eat turkey any time. It's fantastic, isn't it? And a happy new year to one and all. Um, I am really, really privileged, I think, to present this series. Um, because it's something I believe every Christian is not very good at. But you can be, because it's all in the Bible. And we're going to look at the Bible and see how we can make 22 better for you. Because that's what we want, isn't it? You know, was it Del Boy says, Rodney, this time next year we're all going to be millionaires? Yeah, well, why not? Somebody's got to be. Somebody will be. Why not you? You know, why not in your health and in your relationships and everywhere else? And those are better than New Year's resolutions. So I just want to start off with, Jonathan, if you just pop up the first uh, proverb, because this is a vital point that all Christians need to have tattooed on your hearts. Because I get fed up of Christians who say, oh, the devil made me ill, the devil did this, the devil did that. You're not interesting enough to the devil. He can only be in one place at one time. That's the first thing. The demonic might get on your back a bit. But hey, just tonight we're going to look at who you are in God. And I want you to take this on board because we're going to look at a tale of two cities, right? We're looking at Babylon on one side and we're looking at Zion on the other side. And if you're not a Christian, guess what? which one you're in? You're in Babylon, the world's system. How sad can that be? How sad can that be when we look at what it means to be a Christian? So, Jonathan, do you want to pop that scripture up? It was Proverbs 10.22. Don't matter what version, it all means the same. The blessing of the Lord makes one rich. You are all ones. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich. And look at the next bit. And he adds no sorrow with it. So don't give me this stuff about what the devil's doing to you and all that. The blessing of the Lord makes you rich in every area of your life. Because that's what he wants for you. There's going to be some big revelations in this, because I've got some big revelations, I tell you, doing this, putting this together. I've worked for months on this. And so let's forget about New Year's resolutions. And I just want us to think about what Isaiah says in 42.9. And I'm going to use the New King James Version. I don't know whether you've got it there. Okay, I'll tell you what it says. It says, Behold, the former things have come to pass. 21's finished. It's been. It's gone. Can anybody remember 2020? I haven't a clue. Apart from Tesco and Lakeside. Right? So the former things have been. They've gone. They've come to pass, they've been. And new things, I declare, before the spring forth, I'm going to tell you of them. And that's my job over the next six weeks, to tell you of them. To tell you how your life can be totally enriched, walking in the presence and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we're talking about two cities. We're talking about Babylon and Zion. Babylon is the place of money. It's the place of the world. It's the place of corruption. It's the place of wealth and looking for wealth and all that kind of thing. And Zion is the place of the Lord, which is absolutely awesome. We'll get to look at that in a minute. So we're going to look at who we were as non-Christians. We were out there. We didn't have anything of God in our lives. We might have thought we did, but unless we actually had accepted Christ as our saviour, we didn't know him. We didn't know who was saved. We didn't know we had a place waiting for us in heaven. We didn't know we had a mansion waiting for us in heaven, because you didn't. Quite frankly, if you don't know Jesus, the Bible tells us, Jesus said, I am the way, not a way, not an way, not am way, but the way, the truth, and the life. And through no other name does anyone come to the Father except through the Son. Now, if he's saying that with all truth and sincerity, then he's either a liar or he's a madman or he's something else. But he did say it with all truth. And he demonstrated, as we saw last time I did a, a teaching, by the way he lived on earth, the miracles he did, the creative miracles, healing people, all control over the elements, the sea, 
the, the weather, everything, because he is the creator God, and that is what's awesome. So we're going to look at things like the world system of wealth, and we're going to look at God's system of wealth, and what this should mean for us as Christians. And what I want to do is, I want to really set this in tablets of stone. So I want us to pair up, and I want us to speak good things, Bible verses over, over, the, over us. And the way I want to do it is I want the first person to say, th well, if it's me and you, Julie, I would say to you, right, you are a new creation in Christ. And you would say, I am a new creation in Christ. And I would say, I have been, re I am redeemed, recon you, sorry, you are recon redeemed, reconciled, and sanctified through Christ. And you would say, Absolutely, we've got it. So what I've got is I've got a sheet for everybody here. There's quite a few on it, and there's, there's, it's not inexhaustive, in, in is that the word? There's a lot more to them. Pairing up, there we go then. One for each. Right. Hello. Grab a partner. And this should be your mantra written on your heart for who you are. Because if it ain't, you aren't. And you wouldn't understand what this stuff's about. And I feel really sad for non-Christians because they haven't got a clue about this stuff. They have no idea that they are redeemed, sanctified, and reconciled through Christ. Reconciled to God, back in relationship with God, where they should be, where we're supposed to be all the time. Can you uh, do them for us? That's great. Can you do these for us, please? So one each. There we go, if you can give them all one. Right, pair up. And let's give it a go. So first person says to the other person, you are a new creation in Christ. The receiving person says, I am a new creation in Christ. Off you go. If you get stuck, give me a shout. Come on, speak it over each other. It's no good just reading it. Faith comes by hearing the word of God. Speak it over each other. You are a new creation in Christ. I am a new creation in Christ. Oh, join in with your friend next to you. Oh, if you want, whatever. Jo yeah, there's three there, whatever. Whatever we can make pairs, it's one on their own over there. Right, when you're finished, wave your sheet at me. That's it.
Are we believing it? It's all good looking at it. It's all good. <laughs> we have to believe this. We are born again believers. This is directly from the Bible. And I would encourage you to take each one of those scriptures and find them where they are in the Bible and put the verse next to it. That's why I haven't put the verse there. Anybody got the end yet? All right, start again, swap over. Well, you one spoken you, and the other one said I, and the other one now speaks you, and that one says I. Can you see him? <laughs> well, just, just do them again then. <laughs> So we swapped over and going through them again. Just got the jackpot. Well, she sat in a feather. <laughs> so that. Do, 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 do. <coughs> Are we done twice? Not yet, it's all right, no rush. Take your time. I want you to get this deep in your spirit because this is who you are. If you're a born again believer, this is who you are. Every one of those statements is true about you. You just got to believe it. Now we believe in it. Will it change our lives? Will we be able to walk in this tomorrow? Or will we be, as Paul says, like a man who looks in the mirror, sees his face, remembers it, half an hour later he walks away and he's forgotten what he looked like. We need to get this stuff deep down inside, know who we are in Christ. If we're going to walk successfully in 2022, if we're going to be the people who come back with Jesus to rule and reign on earth, we're going to have to be equipped and able to do it. All right, done. Good, three times, that's even better. Right, just to rub it in, who we are, let's all say them together. One, two, three, four. I am a new creation in Christ. I have been crucified with Christ. I am redeemed, reconciled, and sanctified through Christ. I am born again. 
I am a child of God. I have the mind of Christ. I am his workmanship created for good works in him. I can walk with him and talk with him because God is my Abba Father. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I am not my own, but his who made me. I am filled with his Holy Spirit, who leads me into all truth and righteousness. He supplies all my needs according to his riches in his glory in Christ Jesus. He gave me a spirit of power, love, and self-control. I am a member of a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. I am a child of God. I am loved, adopted in his family. I am a prince, princess, or princess of the creator of the universe. I am valued, accepted, and belong in his family. If nobody else does, he does. Right, I am of one blood with the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He wants the best for me and will fight for me. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. He has given me authority in him on earth. I am valued and accepted and belong in his family. I think we've had that one. Jesus is my big brother who ransomed his life for me. I am blessed with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. I am greatly loved. He thinks of me and desires that I am the best I can be for his glory. He has prepared a mansion for me. I am the head and not the tail. I am strengthened with all power according to his glorious might. I am more than a conqueror. I overcome the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. I am not ruled by fear because the Holy Spirit lives in me and gives me his power, love, and self-control. One day I will return with Jesus to rule and reign with him on earth. Revelation. Isn't that awesome? That's who you are. Do you feel it? Do you feel it? If you don't, it's really pontificate on this. Find the scriptures. Ruminate on it. You know, chew the cud as cows do or whatever. And, and let it regurgitate through your system because that's who you are. And the big shame is, right, that those who aren't in Christ, the world is a different place for them. Because that's you. Because that's them. And they ain't got any of that. They haven't got a blind bit of that, so they cannot understand what you're talking about. They don't understand who you are. They don't particularly like you because you have a particular smell about you, right, which they don't understand. They just know that it's there. Some do. Some are attracted by it. But you are of a different world because you are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Get hold of that. You're not just walking this earth. Wherever you go, you are taking the Garden of Eden with you, effectively. The kingdom of God, wherever you go, wherever your foot treads. But the people over this side, they ain't got any of that. They will never know what you know unless they get a revelation and accept Christ as their savior. They will never be able to say, I am the head and not the tail. They might be able to sing, I did it my way. But that's as far as it will go. So what I want us to be able to do before we get into this series is fully understand who you are in Christ. Because if you don't grasp it, you won't get a lot out of it. And to do that, we have to know certain things. And we have to know what the world's way is when it comes to this stuff. Do lolly. Because it's not God's way. But if we don't understand that, right, we will possibly fall into this way of trying to do things. And in doing some research for this, I found out stuff that blew me away. I don't, I don't know whether there's any bankers in here or whether any of you are familiar with it, but do you know that only 3% of this stuff, only 3% of what we, we would call real money is notes and coins. Only 3% in the world is notes and coins. That's the world's way. They chase that stuff. But there's only 3% of it, of the world's notes and coins, right, that are cash. So it begs the question, what the heck's the other 97%? Any ideas? 
It's imaginary numbers. You're right, Graham. It's debt. Debt is the other 97. Well, that's actually 3 to 8. So that is 97 to 92%, and it's debt. That's why your credit score is so damned important, because that's how the world judges your financial status. You've got to be able to show in the world that you can manage debt. Right? When we came back from Australia, we'd been out of the country three years, so we didn't have a credit score anymore. So we went into a shop, tried to buy three B suite, right? And the guy said, it was interest free. So we always do interest free, it's good, that stuff. And the guy said, oh, sorry, Mr. Towers, you, you haven't got a credit score. What? We did before we went, we lived here you know, all that year. Yeah, but you, you've been out of the country more than three years. I was so annoyed, I got my visa card out, and I said, pay for it on that. I was so annoyed. And that's how important this stuff is to the world. It's not God's way, as we'll see in a bit, but it's the world's way. And many moons ago, I asked God about money, and I got a really curt response. I don't often hear from God, but I did on this one. And he just said these few words. He says, well, I didn't make money, you know, a man did. What? <laughs> what? So there's us over here, seated with Christ in heavenly places, trying to puddle through life, doing stuff the world's way. And that's all right, as long as you understand the game that you're involved in. And that's where most of us fall down. Now, it works like this, you see, that, Graham, if you want to buy a house in Armabank, right, and your house is £200,000, right, you come to me and I go, yep, you tick all the right boxes, yummy, yummy, yummy. I am going to lend you £200,000, right? What's your bank account details? Click, 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 click. There you go, 200000 quid is now in your bank. Where did I get that money from? Thin air. Because banks are licensed to print money or to produce money. And that blows you away. They don't have to have even £200,000 in their vaults to lend you £200,000. They just have, a, have to have a license from the government. Because every time they do a loan, right, you start paying interest, right? You're on a promissory note system which says that you will promise to pay that money back. Right, and I can go, well, I'm the bank, and I can add now 200,000 pounds to my accounts. <laughs> Seriously, folks, check it out. This is unbelievable stuff. And it goes right up to government level because this stuff, quantitative easing, is just the government doing that, making up numbers and, and sharing them out. Do you know who owns the debt for America, most of the debt? China. China owns the debt from America. They own the promissory notes for the American debt. Right? So Americans are paying China interest. Unless you understand this stuff, it's going to be very complex to work through where we fit in this dividing line here. Right? Because we can't do without this stuff. We're, in, we are, we're, not in, we're not of the world, but we are in the world. And this is the world's way. And like... Like I read, well, I read one place that says if the government needs money, like they do at the minute, they need trillions of pounds at the minute to cover for COVID smash bang wallop stuff, right? Well, they can, they've got two options. They can either produce money out of thin air like this, get it out there in the system as numbers, quantitative easing, is it called? Or they can print money. Now, they get this. They can print a £10 note for 3p. <laughs> get that. Well, you do it, you get locked up. <laughs> but they can do it. And as soon as they've done it, that, that £10 note that cost them 3p is now worth £9.97 in profit to them. 90, yeah, that's right, 97, yeah. Isn't that amazing? Now, the problem is, is that politicians seemingly love printed money. They love it. They'd have stacks of it because then they've got loads of money to spend on all sorts of programs and projects. But if you, sp if you make too much printed money, you run into this thing called inflation. And what that means is, is that at the moment, our inflation, because of borrowings, is 5.6%, and it's set to go higher. So what that means is, if you've got £100,000 in the bank right now, in 12 months' time, that's going to be worth, effectively, £95,000. You've lost five grand just for keeping it in the bank because inflation's kicked in. And things that used to cost a thousand, a thousand pound now cost, what did I say, a hundred thousand? Now cost nine, 
995,000 pounds. Right, so that house that's 100,000 pound, and you had 100,000 pounds in the bank, 100,000 pound is now equivalent to uh, 900, what's 5%, what's 10% of that, 10,000? Yeah, 995,000 pounds. So that 100,000 has gone down by 5,000 pounds just because you sat it in the bank. The smart folks in the world do not leave money in the bank, only what they need to cover costs. What they do is they push it into investments. Because get this, if a property today costs £100,000, what's it going to cost in one year's time because of inflation? £105,000. Because prices have gone up 5%. So the £100,000 you had in the bank at the end of 12 months is now worth £995,000. But the property that you were going to buy now cost you £105,000. So it cost you an extra £10,000 just to keep up in 12 months' time. Do you get why us Christians need to understand the world's way of money? Because if we do it right, we can be highly blessed. If we do it wrong and just muddle through, we can end up with a big gishmash. So we need to understand what inflation's all about. We need to watch out for inflation. And we'll be looking at opportunities to actually get around this. Now, here's, here's another point. Right, you've got 100 grand sat in the bank, right? And it's now worth 995,000. You've got 100,000 pounds in a house and it's now worth 105,000 and that's only this one 12 months, don't forget, and it's only because of inflation, nothing else in the market. There's that scripture where Jesus said, to those that have, more will be given. And there's two types of scripture about that. One's about, I think it's prayer, but the other one's about stuff. But to those who haven't, it will be taken away. So what happens in inflation? The rich get richer because they have their money in assets, gold, watches, antiques, stocks and shares, property. But the poor don't. They have it in cash. So they get poorer. Think about it in terms of house rental. If you rent a house, right, you're subject to the landlord. So the landlord doesn't care. If inflation kicks in, we just put our prices up. Just put our rents up. Right, so rents go up. In inflation. What does that mean to the, the tenant? It costs them more. The rich get richer, the poor get poorer. Grab a hold of that. You don't see poor Jewish people, do you? They understand this stuff. Blimey, they set up most of the banks in the world. <laughs> yeah. They were very clever people as well, the Jews. I didn't realize this, but have you ever thought why many of them are tailors? Tailors or jewelers? Of course, you can take that anywhere you go in the world. Right? It's a, it's a transferable skill. For many, many years, I was, I was a manager in factories and in business and all sorts of things. I had no transferable skill apart from managing. So, if, if you need a manager, fine, I'm your man. But if you don't, there's probably millions out there. But when I went into teaching, I realized that for the first time in my life, I had an actual transferable skill that I could take to Australia, to Bahrain, to America, anywhere, because I'm a teacher. So job choice when you're young, very important. Took me 55 years to learn that one. <laughs> I got there, but it took me 55 years. Transferable skills are really important. I'm, I'm running ahead of myself now in terms of time. Terms, I mean. Okay, so we dealt with the world's way. I'm not going to say any more than that other than that's a bit of a shock, isn't it, about how, where money comes from, what money is, most of it's debt. Um, even the government is on that racket as well. The other thing, of course, is when the bank... Oh, the other, another important point. When you put money in your bank, now, whatever you do, don't go and rush and take your money out. But legally, the bank owns your money. Yeah. woo -hoo -hoo, that's an interesting one. I mean, it's your account, but, and you can draw on it, but the bank owes your money, owns your money, which is another Im important little thing to consider where you should put your money in the bank or into assets, I would suggest. Okay. So I can't remember what the other point was I was going to make. 
So let's move on to God's way because God doesn't make money. Don't make money at all. Money is of no interest to God. Why is that? Because if you know your Bible, you know that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. All the cattle on a thousand hills. And we don't have to worry about feeding him. <laughs> Just bump a cow on the head and he's got a big steak. Isn't that an awesome way to think? But I tell you what, when you know who you are in God because of the things we've done tonight, right, you can call on them cattle. Say, Lord, send us a cow down. I'm hungry. <laughs> Why not? You're one of his kids. You're not going to see you starve, right? Get away from all this old crap about the devil this and the devil that. You are a prince or a princess. And now we need to start thinking like that and living like that in Christ. That's where the good stuff comes in. Okay, so let's have a look at God's way. So, have you got your Bibles with you? Let's turn to Genesis 1.26. And you'll see there is a massive difference between the God of this world and his money, which we have to use. It's the currency of uh, value, the only currency that we've got of value. And let's see what... God set up right at the start, and it's never, ever changed. So, I'm going to read it. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So you have authority. You have authority in Christ. You have his authority. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. This is the kicker. The next line. Shout it out, somebody. Shout it. Then God blessed them. That's God's way. That's God's way. It's not this stuff, money. Money can be part of it. But you can see now where it says in the Bible, the root of all evil Money is a root of all evil, not the root, a root. Because if we put the world's things before God when he wants to bless us and we go chasing our butt off after money, we're chasing the wrong thing. We should be chasing his blessing because that's what he set up right at the start. And God is a God of sowing and reaping. So as we go through life sowing the things that's in our image of God, we will reap. And we'll look at them in future weeks. But that's the first thing I want us to know, that yes. How can I uh, further uh, enhance this? Well, if we look at Malachi 3, 10 to 12, which is a good one. It's the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 3. And it's the one where he's, uh, God's banging on about them not tithing. Let's see what he says. Uh, where is it? 3, 10, 10, 10, 10. Yeah, right. He says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse. Well, he had storehouses in them days, so it was very possible. That there may be food in my house, and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open for you the windows of heaven, and look what he says. He doesn't say pour out money. He says, and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. Blessing. Blessing is the currency of heaven. Blessing is what biblical economics is about. It's about positioning ourselves in position to be blessed in God. It's about knowing who we are in Christ. If we know who we are in Christ, we can reach out because he is our Abba Father. He does know how to give us good gifts. He don't put sickness on it. Where does that come from? You know? Mm. I've got this sickness on me. God doesn't love me anymore. That comes out of Christian insecurity. And I'll say that to the camera. Christian insecurity. If you're one of those Christians who goes around thinking you're so blessed because God's put some kind of illness or disease on you, you're barking up the wrong tree. You need to read your Bible and get stuck into it and see what God really says. God wants to bless you. Every single one of you. And he has no favorites. So... You can have as much blessing as you want. Isn't that awesome? You've just got to believe it and walk in it. Okay, so we've dealt with two areas where God says about blessing. Next week, we'll have a look at some uh, 
particular areas of blessing. Oh, I've done that one. Right, next one. Right, two Gospels I'm going to deal with straight away. One is the famous poverty gospel, and the other one is the famous, uh, what is it? Not poverty. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Oh, what do they call it? Prosperity gospel, yeah, because they're both from the pit. They are both from the pit. Is there anybody in here who believes poverty is godly? No. Jesus didn't. Not at all. He went healing the sick. He went controlling wind and waves, but he never gave the poor money, did he? Right? Because he said the poor are always with you. We don't have to be poor because we know who we are in Christ now. And there are more scriptures that you can add to that list about who you are in Christ. So poverty is not good. In fact, wherever you look in the world where there's poverty, there's usually disease. There's usually despots who rip everything off. Who was that one I saw the other night? I can't remember, but he ripped... Oh, it was on the GFK program. Um, I think he was the president of Cuba who did a runner when Castro came to power. And what he did was he ran off with $4 million. <laughs> Uganda, I mean, did something similar. These people want badges. They want power. When I traveled in Africa... The national presidents I met of junior chamber all just wanted the badge. Some of them even got rid of all the members so they could have the badge and get to all the finest dines and dinners. Right? That was in Malawi, in particular in Egypt. So, poverty is not good. Disease comes with poverty. Right? Shortages come with poverty. Lack of food comes with poverty. So the question is, was Jesus poor? Poor Jesus, meek and mild, looked upon the little child. By earthly standards, no, he wasn't, but by heavenly standards, by heck, he was. <laughs> right? <laughs> but when he walked on earth, well, we'll go on to what happened when he walked on earth. Um, because in heaven, there is actually opulence. Whereas in poverty countries, there's corruption, filth, disorder, vi violence. Try living poor. Try going on the streets for a month. Live on the streets. No money, nothing. It's not fun, poverty. Not fun at all. Begging, not fun. Right? Not a good way to live, I would suggest. So compared to living in heaven, yes, Jesus was poor here on earth. Because let's look at where, that, where he did live, or the, area, the kind of place he did live, in Revelation 4.28. Uh, 4.228, sorry, if you've got your Bibles there. Revelation 4. It's at the back. Those who don't know, it's at the back. Four twenty-eight. I hope I've got the right scripture. Do -do -do -do. Whoops! No, I haven't. Four two to eight, wasn't it? And uh, John says, "After these things, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven." He had a squint through the door in heaven. Yeah. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which you must, which must take place after this. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat on the throne. This is, this is you know, normal to Jesus. This is court life. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald, a green rainbow. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes. And they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within. And they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's where Jesus is from. A place like that. No wonder they say he was poor on earth. Of course he was. 
Blimey. <laughs> I think the Queen would find it hard-pressed if she stepped out. Of, well, the Queen's a bit old now, but maybe some of the other royal family would find it hard-pressed if they moved out of, uh, of the Buckingham Palace or wherever they live and tried to live normal like we all sort of do, as mere humans do. So yes, Jesus was poor when he came from heaven to earth. If we want to pack that out a bit more, let's have a look at Revelation 21, 9 to 21. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls filled with the seven last plagues came to me and talked to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her light was like a most precious stone, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Also, she had a great and high wall with 12 gates and 12 angels at the gates and names written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. Three gates on the east, three gates on the north, three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. Now the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and on them were the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. Where am I reading to? 21. Then he measured its walls, 144 cubits according to the measure of a man, that is, of an angel. The construction of its walls was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with all kinds of precious stones. The first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophase, the eleventh jacinth, and the twelfth amethyst. The 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each individual gate was of one pearl. And the, street, uh, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Whew, that's where Jesus lives. He lives in that environment. He lives in that wonderful environment. What will it be like when we get up there and see heaven? Oh, there's the key to your mansion, sir. Oh, can you imagine you won't feel poor up there because you're a prince or a princess. Why would you? Start living like it down here now. Start taking authority. Start commanding things to happen because you're a prince or a princess. You are in heavenly places with Christ. So when he comes down to earth, yeah, pretty poor by that standard. <laughs> but I want, to tell, I want to share some things about, about Jesus' life on earth because he gets a bad press, you know, about him being poor. Oh, man, he was so poor. He didn't have anywhere to lay his head. Well, what the heck was he doing at Peter's mother's house then? Down the road, <laughs> he was laying his head. He was a mate, you know, Peter was his mate. If you, if you read your Bible, it's there. Read your damn Bible, for goodness sake. It's all there. Oops, maybe I shouldn't have sworn there, but I'll get carried away. Okay. So, let's have a look at this poor man. The man who could turn water into wine. Wow, couldn't he have had a business? <laughs> couldn't he have had a business? <laughs> What's that one now? The, the, big, the guy who has all these pubs everywhere and meals everywhere? Oh, he could have outstripped him a thousand times. Oh, just bring a few buckets of washing up water. Wine. Bottle that. He paid his temple tax from a car of this caught in a fish's mouth. Don't you just love that one? Peter's blah, 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 about playing the temple tax. Blah, blah, blah. What are we going to do, Lord? What are we going to do? He says, Peter, you're a fisherman. Go and catch a fish. <laughs> Peter goes, puts his line in, boink, pulls a fish up, gets what's in its mouth. The temple tax, the coin. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? This is our poor Messiah, our great and godly Messiah. He turned a little boy's lunch into a meal for 5,000 plus people. Even Gordon Ramsay can't do that. Right? And then he did it again for 4,000 people. I bet it tasted good as well. And in Luke 8, 1 to 3, we find that he had women supporters. Let's have a look at that. Luke 8, 1 to 3. And these weren't just any old women. Solomon. Oh, it's at the front, isn't it? At the back of me. Luke. 
Anybody got it? Can't see the pages rustling. Uh, oh, no, it's not that way. It's this way, isn't it? Gee whiz. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Luke 8, 1 to 3. Okay, Luke 8, 1 to 3. No, I'm still not there. Uh, right. Ah, here we go. It says, well, I'll read the bit before. And certain woman who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. These are people who were with Jesus. And Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's steward. Whoa, she would be a posh lady. She would have plenty of readies. He supported Jesus' life and ministry. And Susanna and many others who provided for him from their substance. Come on, get off this thing that Jesus was poor. And you're not poor either. Not if we're walking with the Lord. Not if you're a born-again believer, walking close to the Lord. If you don't, well, fine, that's up to you. He'll just let you get on with it. You can do it your way. But let's walk close to the Lord in 2022. Eh? Let's make it our first priority. We know now who we are in Christ. Start believing it. Start walking in it. Start seeing Jesus, who he really is. He's not coming back as some wuss. He's coming back as the Lion of Judah. He's coming back on a white charger to take control of the earth. And you're going to be with him to rule and reign. How would you like to rule South Yorkshire, sir? He might give you that job. <laughs> or Derby. Or Doncaster. Somebody's got to do it. He's not going to sit there and press a load of buttons. The Christians who are coming back with him when we go up in the sky to meet with him as he comes back down. It's a bit like, a, I don't know, like an escalator, isn't it? Oh, we go up, now we're coming down. And those who are in, in dead will rise, in Christ will rise first. But we come down to reign and rule with him. So Jesus was not some pushover poor guy, that's for sure. I love the story in Matthew 14, 16, and Luke 9, when we're talking about the feeding of the 5,000. And you've got to see this for yourself. So just look up Luke 9. Uh, where is it? Uh, Luke 9. Got to find it, got to find it. Right, feeding the 5,000. Verse 11, when the multitudes knew it, they followed him, and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. When the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said to him, send the multitudes away that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. Don't forget, 5,000 men plus women plus children. Yeah, unbelievable. Unbelievable. Send the multitude away, the disciples said, that they may go into the surrounding towns and country and lodge and get provisions. For we're in a desert, deserted place. If you ever been in a deserted place, it's not worse. Tell you, Alice Springs is unbelievable. That he said to them, you give them something to eat. <laughs> Was Jesus a comedian or what? Come on, you give them something to eat. Why do you think he might say that? I think he'd already given them authority. It's just that they probably didn't know what to do at that point. But that was his response. You give them something to eat. And they said, we have no more than five loaves and two fish unless we go and buy. Did you see that word? Buy. Buy food for all these people. So what they're inferring there is they had enough money to buy food for 5,000 men plus a load of women. <laughs> It's unbelievable, isn't it? When you really get into the, the nub of the scriptures, you start to see things and not just gulp down all the stuff you've been fed over the years. When you see it for yourself, when you check it out again in Matthew, it's the same picture. Go and buy them something. Go and buy the food. For there were about 5,000 men. Then he said to his disciples, make them sit down in groups of 50. And they did so and made them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them and gave them to the disciples to set before the multitude. So they all ate and were filled and 12 baskets of the leftover fragments were taken up by them. I actually did wonder when I saw that you give them something to eat. 
where Jesus was actually inviting them to do exactly what he did just there, <laughs> to bless, the, bless whatever food was there and to multiply it. Because do you remember he said things like, well, if you had the faith the size of a mustard seed, you could take this mountain shift. Uh, well, you know, he's given us authority like that. We've got to practice it. We've got to walk in it. We've got to speak into bad situations, right? Declare the Lord's love and the Lord's power and the Lord's lordship over such things. And we'll just have a quick look at what it said in Matthew 14, 16 on the same story. And I think... We'll so probably get to the end then. Matthew 14, 16. Right. Oh, it was the same thing. He said, they do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, we have here only five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them here to me. Then he commanded the multitude to sit down on the grass and he took the five loaves and the two fish and blessed them and gave thanks for them and gave them out to the people. I thought there was a one there where it said something else, but it doesn't, it must be another scripture. Oh, it's probably Mark 6.37, Matthew, Mark. Let's see what Mark records on this. And don't forget, he gets his word from Peter, who was there, 6.37. Ah, I love, I love, this, <laughs> love this one. Right. Um, and listen to their response. The disciple said, send them away that they may go into the surrounding country and villages and buy themselves bread for they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? Did you hear that? They had obviously 200 denarii. So is that what somebody's telling a fib when this is being written? But they're saying, we've got 200 denarii. We could buy them some bread with that. But they have nothing to eat. But he answered and said to them, you give them something to eat. Da, da, da. Uh, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? But he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. And they found out. They said the five and the two fish. And it all went from there. So I hope in those three accounts of the feeding of the 5,000, you can see that Jesus wasn't any pushover when it came to, you know, multiplication, blessing, m making things grow, right? Speaking into situations. And he was inviting the disciples, I reckon, to speak into situations too. Um, he said this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each one of them to get a little so, you know, they had money. I mean, didn't Judas, isn't he the one who was acclaimed in folklore to be the one who was the accountant who carried the bag and used to dip into the bag? Well, they had money, didn't they? They had money. So let, let's, let's get out of this poor Jesus stuff. Equally, let's get off this prosperity stuff. Because prosperity only works if you do it God's way. There's no such thing as blab it and grab it, right? Teachers would like to, to, to believe, let you have believe that stuff. Um... Right, where are we? Right, dealt with that one. So, prosperity gospel. Oh, my last bit. Hmm. I've lost it somewhere. It's here somewhere. Uh, poverty. Yeah. Mm -mm -mm. Right. Just bear with me a minute. It's there somewhere. It was when I came out. Okay, we'll pick up from there. Right, blessing is to receive from God his favor and receive good things from his hand. Desire it because it makes life easier, more enjoyable, satisfying, and wonderful. Try living without. It's not fun. Not fun at all. Try living on the bread line. It's not fun. But when you are blessed as you are, probably haven't realized it yet, but you are blessed and there's more blessings to come, you will see God's work at hand in your life. I just want to finish with this one story, right? When we went to Australia, we sold the house. We had a nice big four-bedroom detached house on the river at Beedale. We sold it, put everything into going to Bible college, right? Now, I'm not saying this to brag. I'm saying this to tell you how God works and how he's worked in our life. I'm giving it as a testimony, right? We spent... 
our, our savings that we had on Bible college. Fortunately, we bought Carrie's dad's council house. It was cheap, and we had a bit of money, so we did it. We'd made some profit on it. And then four years later, having worked effectively in a warehouse, pick and pack stuff for a Christian warehouse, um, part-time while we are at college, and then working for an Aboriginal organization, um, it was time to come back to Britain. We didn't want to come back. Well, I didn't want to come back to Britain, but I'd, I'd had enough. I really had had enough. I won't go into the story. So when we came back to Britain, this was the sum total of our finances, right? We had nowhere to live because we sold house, right? We had no transport. We got rid of the car. We gave it away before we went, right? We were living on a farm in the middle of nowhere between Thirsk and North Allerton. The snow was about six inches deep. It was unbelievable, right? And guess how much we had in the bank? Five grand. That was it. That was it. Folks, believe me, that was it. But I've just got to say, if you look at your lives, you will see that you are so blessed of God, it's untrue. And God turned that situation around for us or led us down a path to where we're not going to brag about it, but we're quite happy in where God's brought us from, the journey we've been on, and where we've still yet got to go, because he ain't finished with us yet. Until we get promoted, it's just going to get wilder and wilder. So what I'm going to leave you with is this. You now know who you are in Christ. You now know how precious you are to God, right? Don't ever think for one minute you're not. You are very, very precious. He bought you with a price. He bought you with nails through his wrists and nails through his feet and a spear in his side. He bought you with his own blood. So think about who you are in Christ. Walk as Christ would have you walk. Get into your Bible. Understand what that means. I just find there's too many Christians who work off folklore and not what it says in the Bible. Get into your Bible. Find what that means. Because as I said, blessing is to receive God from God, his favor, and receive good things from his hand. Not bad things. It says, doesn't it, in the Bible, you know, men know how to give good gifts. How much more your father in heaven's going to give you? Oh, you know, God's put so much on me. Rubbish. I hate that with a vengeance, and God does too. Right, you are blessed. You just want to wake up, see how much blessing you've got. Declare these, these sayings over you until you know them in your sleep. And declare them and declare them and declare them. Declare the blessings of God. And desire that blessing because it does make life easier, more enjoyable, satisfying, and wonderful. Even Paul said that. He, says, he said, I know it, how, how it is to live with nothing. I know it is to live with much, to abound in more. And more or less, I know which is the better. And he's right. Because if you are in a position to be, in God's eyes, blessed and wealthy, you can make choices. You cannot make choices if you're living on the street. You cannot make choices if you're up to your eyes in debt. You cannot make choices if you're living on the bread line and the poverty line. You need to be blessed. You need God's blessing in your life. And that comes, as I'm going to say in Romans 10, 17, uh, through faith. And faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of God. So you better believe it. You better believe what we're going to be talking about, not just tonight, but the next six weeks, because it's what God's got for you, and he wants you to be blessed. And the final scripture I'd leave you with is Matthew 6.33, which says, But seek first, first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Seek first the kingdom. Remember who you are, why you don't fit with people of the world, where you really live, which is not in the world, you're just passing through. Hebrew says of Abraham, he was a guy who was looking for, you know, the place where God is. That's why he could put up with living in a tent so long, but he was blessed. Thousands of sheep, thousands of goats, so many sheep that him and Lot had to separate. He was blessed. He was blessed. And his children were blessed. And the Jews are a blessed nation. Just remember all that. And you seek first the kingdom of God. So let's just finish tonight there. And next, next week we'll expand this, uh, this area of blessing. 
So, Lord, I just want to thank you for your word. I just want to thank you that you make it very clear, Lord, uh, whose we are, that we're of you, Lord, and not of the world. Help us, Lord, to keep our eyes on you when the boat that we're in in the world starts to rock, when things start to get rocky with finances. Let us remember that it's you, Lord, who gives us the blessing. It's you who commands the blessing, Lord. And it's not the things of this world that we need to be seeking. Lord, I just pray that you just protect every one of us. Everyone who's heard this, this word tonight, Lord, let them know who they are in you, Father, and walk in it in Jesus' name. Amen.